Uh, we're going to, we've sort of, sort of completed our uh, sequence of lectures on convolutional networks. So uh, we are going to pick on, uh, start on the next series of topics. This one will be a longer series. This is on recurrent neural network models, which are used to analyze time series data. Now, the problem here is this. In many situations, we are re required to consider a series of inputs to produce an output. And the output may also be a series. So let's look at some examples of the kinds of problems where you have to analyze an entire series of data before you produce an output, like speech recognition. You want to determine what was said. You know, did the person say to be or did the person say not to be? So it's not like detecting a word. We want, we're trying to recognize what was said, right? And you can't really figure out what was said till you get to the end of the sequence of inputs. So you have to analyze an entire sequence of vectors, and then you produce an output. Or here's a nice example. This is, this is a very common kind of sentence that occurs this time of the year. The Steelers are famous for losing, particularly about this time of the year. They have been for 10 years. And so the Steelers, meanwhile, continue. I, I can use the same example every year, and it's still valid. Uh, the Steelers, meanwhile, continue to struggle to make stops on defense. They've allowed, on average, 30 points a game and have shown no signs of improvement anytime soon. Some of you may not know who the Steelers are because you're new to Pittsburgh. Can you tell me what sport is being spoken about? Football. football. That's because you know the Steelers <laughs> play football, right? But otherwise, is there any hint over here about what sport is being playing, sport discussed? Pardon me? There is nothing. There's just defense and offense, right? We know it's football, but that's because we have prior information. So here's the problem. You want to analyze the entire sequence, and only when, to you, when you get to the end or somewhere in the middle, you don't, know, don't really know where, you will know what the game is about. So you know, if it were not Steelers, it was some, some other random name, you'd have to figure out how many points were being discussed, what is the duration of the game. There's a, there are hints about what kind of game is being discussed, but you cannot really make that analysis until you get to the end. Similarly, text analysis. You have to analyze a document and identify a topic. So the input is a series of words, and the output is some classification output. Or machine translation. You want to read in a sequence of English words. You want to output a sequence of you know, whatever was spoken in or said in French. So in all of these cases, you have to analyze a sequence of inputs and then produce an output. Or oh, here's something that's much more uh, uh, relevant to the finance industry, making predictions about the stock market. Typically, you make predictions on a daily basis, and you make your investments based on, the day, on, on your daily predictions. So now, the input is a sequence of vectors. It could be stock values or indices for every day. So each vector has got a bunch of indices and a bunch of numbers. And you read, uh, you know everything until today, and then you make predictions today about what is likely to happen tomorrow or in the next week. So once again, you have to analyze a sequence of inputs and make a prediction. And now the prediction itself can also be a scalar. Should I, should I not invest in Apple? Or a vector, you know, which are the things that are good to invest in? Again, the decision must be taken considering how things have fared over time. So in every one of these problems, you're considering a sequence of input, input vectors, and you produce one or more outputs. And obviously, this is just a, this is just a function. It's a prediction problem. You can do this with neural networks, right? So let's see how we will do this in the next few classes. But before that, I want to introduce some representation that we will use. Typically, you've seen your neural networks drawn like this, except you know, you're drawn face on. So this would be your input. That's your first hidden layer, the second hidden layer, the output. I'm going to draw the neural network side on henceforth, at least for this series, because that's uh, otherwise it's going to be impossible to represent everything. So I would draw this figure in this manner. This little blue square represents the entire input layer. So you've got to imagine a sequence of units going into the page. So also each one of these green boxes represents an entire layer. 
So you have to imagine a sequence of inputs going into the page. And this one here is the entire output layer. You're again imagining a sequence of inputs going into the page. When I draw an arrow of this kind, you have to imagine a fully connect, a complete connection. Every neuron, every unit in the lower, in, at the lower layer connecting to every unit in the upper layer. Of course, the specific implementation have, may or may not have some of these connections, but this is the most generic setting, right? So if you see something of this kind, imagine that this is the figure. Or if you had a network which is looking at two distinct vectors of inputs, you did this for homework one, right? This is what the network would look like if I just angled it slightly, but I'm actually going to draw it this way. So when I draw something of this kind, that means that each of these is an entire sequence of units going into the page. Each of these boxes is also a sequence of units going into the page. So is this guy on top. Every arrow is a complete set of connections from the input to the output. So this is a full set of connections from every unit here to every unit here. One full set of connections from every unit here to every unit here, right? Or just to drive the point home, if you had a network of this kind, this is how I'm going to draw it. Everyone clear with the picture? So don't get confused. When you see a dot, it doesn't mean that I have parallel connections. It's, a, it's an entire layer of neurons. I have not specified how many neurons or how many units there are in the layer. And the set of connections from, one, from the source to the destination of every link is complete. Let's return to our problem. So now, we have, we're trying to make a stock market prediction. On each day, you have to decide whether or not you want to make an investment in a specific stock or in some collection of stocks. So if you want to do this, how does the stock market, you know, what is most indicative of what is likely to happen today in the stock market? What happened yesterday, what happened yesterday right? So if I were to do that, what kind of network would I use over here to make predictions? Again, if I'm talking about what's going to happen tomorrow, that's really the prediction you're making, right? So I have some input today, and you're saying it, what happened today is indicative of what's happening tomorrow. Is that the only thing that indicates what's happening? Pardon me? History, right? So you want to say, there's a trend. Some stock is going up, some stocks are going down. You want to look at what happened in the past few days. So what would your network look like? Yeah? It would like take the past few days. Right? You would have the past few days into your network and make your prediction. It's the obvious thing to do, right? So I need someone other than Bharat to reply. If you don't want me to point fingers at you, you pipe up on your own, okay? So here's what you do. You'd have a sliding predictor. You're going to look at the past few days. This is a convolutional network, right? Scanning for patterns. This is what we saw in the several classes ago. So each day you'd be looking back at the past several days and making a prediction. Now this is just scanning in one dimension. What kind of convolutional network was this, Ben? It's a 1D CNN, right? It's also what we call a time delay neural network. So this is how we'd make our predictions. Now this is what, this is a finite response system. What I mean by a finite response system, well, let me, let me uh, ask you. Suppose some event were to occur at time t plus three, and this is the network you were using. For how many days in the future is this going to influence your prediction? Aparajit, can you tell me? The last one. If I had something happen at t plus three, for how many days is it going to make influence the predictions? Four, five, six. Three, four, five, six, right? Because it's only looking back three days. So any event is only influencing the output for a finite duration of time. This is a finite response system. More generally, I can Think of the network like so. The output at any time t is a function of the current input and the past n inputs. And consequently, any 
event is going to influence the output for the next n days, right? And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. Take a look at the input on the red box. Uh, when at t minus 1, obviously, it doesn't influence the output. At t, it does. At t plus 1, it does. At t plus 2, it does. At t plus 3, it does. And then its influence is gone. Now, when you have a network of this kind, let's go back to the stock market. The uh, stock market, how many, how many days in the past do you really want to be looking uh, at when you're making predictions for the stock market? It's got to be a pretty long a period of time, right? You can't say just two days or three days. That doesn't really tell you anything. So you want to increase the history, but make increasing the history makes the network more complex. We can say no big deal, right? I can go back 300 days, and still the total number of parameters is not going to, you know, not going to be that large. So maybe I can, I don't really need to worry about it, right? I can just do this. Here's the problem: the things that influence your predictions can happen at any time in the past. Just consider the stock market. It has weekly trends. People buy things more on Sunday and Saturday than they do on uh, in the middle of the week. People go to restaurants and pubs on Friday, right? You have monthly trends. People spend money shortly after they get their paycheck. You have season, uh, seasonally trends. Every, at the end of every season, all the stores get new stock. They dump their old stock in thrift stores. You go to the thrift store and buy cheap. The, oh, and then you have annual trends. What happens this Thanksgiving is going to be pretty predictive of what's going to happen next Thanksgiving. But then you want to look back several Thanksgivings to find the trend at Thanksgiving. So how long do you want to actually look back? Infinite time. You want to go back as far as possible right, to the beginning of time, except that as you go back in time, you want to consider their influ the influences less and less. Something that happened 10 years ago is probably not telling about what's happening, what's going to happen tomorrow. So you'd need something of this kind. Is this even feasible? This is not. Correct? We need something different. They cannot see the pointer. Manish, can you get my sword from my office? In case it's not open. Okay. All right. I think we're out of time. No, actually, no. We have another 20 seconds. He's catching every spare second to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. OK, guys, let's continue, right? The first statement was true. The second was false. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK. So what we want is an infinite response system over here. We don't want just any odd finite response system. You want an infinite response system where something that happens at any time influences the output all the way to the end of time. And simple structures such as this one are clearly not going to do the job. So let's change our structure. What I'm going to do is something slightly different. I'm going to say the output at any time is a function not only at the input at that time, but also the output at the previous time. Now, if I have something of this kind, then if I have, say, an event that occurs on day 0, and then I have no further inputs, what would happen? How long will the influence of that event survive? Does anybody want to tell me? Forever, Forever right? Because 
you have x0, which is going to affect y0. But then y0 is going to affect y1. Then y1 is going to affect y2. This continues forever. What, but, but then this is not complete. I have to specify some, something extra in order for this to function. What would that be? Pardon me? X? So I'm, you know, so I'm saying there is no further input over here. So maybe someone at the back, James, can you tell me what is missing? I'd need to produce specify y minus 1, right? What was the output at the 0th time? So there's an initial state of some kind that we would have to specify to make this complete. But once we do so, then so we have to define y. You know, it helps to look at the slide. So you have to define y of minus 1. But once you do so, something that happens at any time is going to influence the output forever. So this kind of network is what is called a NARCS network, nonlinear autoregressive network with exogenous inputs. I'm not sure where that name come, came from, but it sounds very fancy. And where is the information about the history stored in the network? Is, it, is the information about the history stored in the network at all? How many think yes? How many say no? You guys are right, right? The entire information is being stored in the output. There's nothing inside the input network that specifically stores the history. Nonetheless, this does, it does the job. So here's how it would uh, operate. If you have a Knox network with recursion from the output, at time t, you're going to produce some output yt. And then at the next time, the next input and this yt are both fed into the network. And then it produces the next output. And then at the next time, this output and the input here produce the next output and so on. This sort of goes all the way to the end of time, right? And you can see how a single input influences every single output. But then, uh, and to see this, it makes, it helps to see the entire set of computations that happened. So this is showing you every single computation that happened at, times, at, at time t. The network worked on this input and the previous output. At time t plus 1, the same network worked on this input and the previous output, correct? And this kept happening. Now you can see how an input at any time influences the output forever. You just have to follow the arrows. If I have an input at this time, it goes up all the way here. Then you get come back here, it goes up all the way here, come back here, it goes up all the way here. So if all I had was this input and no further outputs over here, this is no different from just an infinitely deep network, correct? This is essentially just an infinitely deep network, but what is the structure of the network, of this infinitely deep network? It's going to be the same set three layers repeated over and over and over again, right? So anyway, instead of actually drawing the output separately, I'm just going to take the shortcut and say there are two outputs going from here, one straight out, one going to the next time. There's the same figure. Questions so far? Anything? OK. Now, in principle, a network of this kind doesn't need to consider only the immediate past output. You could be looking at the past k outputs. It doesn't need to consider only the current input. You could be looking at the past k inputs. So a generalization of a network of this kind would be something like this, where you look at some k, out, k past outputs and some L or inputs from the past in addition to the current input. So this, is, uh, this would be an L, K, order Knox network. This is just generalization, yeah. So when you say that you're passing the uh, output of the previous time step to the next uh, time step, uh, do we assume that you will do the right trans like the correct transformation? Because when you're passing, bo both the inputs to the network have to either have to be like dimensionally correct. No, it's just I have a neuron here, and this neuron has a bunch of inputs. These would be xt, 
these would be y t minus 1. So we're just appending them together, right? Have I lost here? No, OK, so it kind of matters, right? So if I have a network here, it's not merely taking this output. It's taking both of these terms as inputs. So the actual input is going to be xt, yt minus 1. There is no additional transformation. It's just a concatenation of the two. Yes, Ichan? Chen? That's, so this is the generalization, right? You could be looking at the past k outputs. That is the assumption that you have over here. That's the assumption, correct? Right. It doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily true. It's going to fall off exponentially. We'll discuss those in the next class. I hear you. So yes. Just tell me this, right? If I had y of t equals alpha y of t minus 1 plus all some beta y of t minus 2 plus xt, would this be equivalent of some other gamma of y of t minus 1 plus xt? Would these two be equivalent? That's basically what it is, right? One is a second order system, one is a first order system. One of them, if, you, if they were oscillators, they would have different periods. Now, these Knox networks were very popular for time series prediction. They were used extensively for things like predicting weather, stock markets, all, and alternate systems for models and tracking systems. And any phenomenon which had a distinct innovation, an input, that drove an output. So this is just a nonlinear version of your standard autoregressive models, autoregressive moving average models. And so uh, they're pretty popular. The situation here, yes? So I have a question. You set in price as here to the next network inducing stock market. Then I just consider the following case. If I only, want, only have one stock, right? The next, uh, if the next uh, network is sent to me, that you only, uh, the input is only one time scale. Correct. I only have one stock. This means that I'll, I will only have one sample. No, you're going to have the sample to over time, right? Again, think about this. That's if your sample is oscillating like that versus if your sample is oscillating like that, the amount of time you have to look back to figure out how the thing is changing is different in the two cases, correct? So you're basically saying that when you increase the time, you are, uh, it's equivalent to actually increase the sample size. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of looking at the increasing the order of your predictor, basically. So the complex, something that, uh, maybe it gets a little too complex. I can take this offline. But if, I ha if I'm looking back at something over four periods of time versus looking back at something just over one period of time, here I can capture three different periodicities. Whereas in the other case, there's only one periodicity that I can capture. So as you increase the order, the complexity of the patterns that you can actually recognize increases, right? So here, for example, the, I can figure I, if every second input, if every second output has the same value, that's a periodicity of two, correct? This guy is not going to rec recognize it. This guy would. If every third one had the same value, the first guy would recognize it, the second guy would not. As you increase the history, you're going to be able to detect more and more patterns. Make sense? Right? So the problem here is that the memory of the network is in the output. It's not in the and hidden in the network. There's no intermediate variable in the network that, that actually say that you can point out and say this is what this is the variable that summarizes everything that's happened in the world so far. What we'd like to have is some way of making this memory more explicit. So if I want to make a memory more explicit, what I, would, I can do is to introduce a memory unit. 
there's one component of the network whose only job is to store some information about the history. Now, the memory that I store at any time clearly depends on the previous outputs, depends on whatever is happening in the network at the current time and, and the previous time, but also depends on previous memory, right? Memory has to be retained. So m of t is going to be some function of m of t minus 1 and the rest of the uh, variables in the network. And then if you're thinking of a network, aha, thank you. So this is for the folks in Piazza. I have my sword. I need a longer sword or I have to grow taller. Anyway, uh, the, uh, so over here, when you're speaking of h of t out here, that is just the hidden state in your network. So at any time, the hidden state of your network is going to depend on the current input and the memory, what has been stored in, what's stored in the network to represent the past. And you, of course, have the output itself being computed from the memory, right? From the hidden state. So let's look at a couple of examples of how this could be implemented. The first one was uh, by this guy, Michael Jordan, not the basketballer. Uh, Michael Jordan is actually a very famous uh, professor from currently at Berkeley. He used to be at MIT in the past. And he's very well known for his work on uh, latent Dirichlet analysis and such like. But his first work, his thesis, I believe, was on this uh, very simple memory model. And his idea was, well, let's introduce something in the network which actually stores memory. And so for that, he introduced a so-called memory neuron, and the memory unit simply stored the running average of all of the past history. So this actually doesn't improve matters over the basic Knox network itself. Instead of just looking at the, the one past output, it was looking at a running average of all past outputs. But then he introduces this little memory unit shown in, shown in black in the middle which captures, which retains this running history of past outputs. And that one unit's value is what is representative of everything that happened in the past. Now, because this memory unit itself is just retaining a, a running average of past outputs, there's no learning. It's just a very fixed computation. So as far as learning to respond to patterns in the input, if you were performing back propagation, there's no information from the future that's being propagated backwards through the network when you're training. So there's no true recurrence over here. There's no actual within network reference to past history. You just have this one plug-in variable that sort of stores the memory. Now, so this guy, Elman, decided to upgrade on, uh, update it. Why just, I mean, if you look at the Jordan network, it's still not referring to internal variables in the, in, the, in the network. So why not extend it to do something more obvious? Let's actually store the uh, memory inside the network. So what he did was to introduce this so-called uh, context state whose only job in life was to capture the hidden states at the current time and hold it. So it cloned the hidden state. And this cloned hidden state at any time informs the predictions at the next time. Now, what's the purpose of cloning? At his time, for some reason, uh, they thought this was a really good idea. Or at least this guy did. And the idea was you have any input, you have the hidden state, and then you compute the output. Then you copy this over, so you actually clone it. It's like copying the whole thing with just a weight of one. And this one informs the hidden state at the next time, which you try to use to compute the next output. Now the this business of cloning sort of simplifies matters. It's like saying I have, if I have many different, I have several time steps, 
it's like ha it's like having many different individual networks because and there is no information passed this way during back propagation so to train the network he could just look at each column individually and train and you and just think of these as many copies of the same network and every single input is being treated as an isolated input the only only thing that happened was there's an extra input which is being carried over from the hidden state of the previous time so there is there, there was no derivative there was no gradient being passed back in this direction when the network was being trained so the purpose of cloning the hidden state was just to say i can split up the input the, the, the network into many individual columns and i can train i can train the network in this manner yeah so uh, now you're saying uh, we need gradient going uh, back backward in time so there is no gradient going past this edge one So, so you would have gradients, you have, you have the error here. You would have gradients going here and here. So these weights and these weights would get updated. But then the gradients, an error at yt plus 2 does not influence the gradients at yt minus t, t plus 1. So you're, you would do that anyhow, regardless of how you train things, right? The only point is that an error at time at this time suppose you only made an error here if you made only made an error over here and the, all the rest of the all, all the rest of the outputs were perfect then is it enough to just consider what happened over here to update the network clearly not right because this error here is an accumulation of a lot of things that happened in the past and that is being ignored. You just slice things out and say, I'm going to use this locally. I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to update this weight, and then I'm going to, sh I'm going to share it across all time. Yeah. That also means the, parameter, the parameters are not shared in different time frames? The parameters are shared. Are shared. The parameters are shared. Oh, each one of these networks is identical, correct? Each, the only issue is that some error that happens here only gives you gradients over here. So it doesn't consider the fact that an error at any time is really the cumulative outcome of something that happened in all previous times. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The entire network is the same for every. So why you are saying you update time step by time step, you update the same So again, remember what we did with gradient descent, right? Let's again consider the situation where you have an error only at time t plus 2. OK, if I have an error at only time t plus 2, what are the gradients out here? There is no error. All gradients are 0. Correct? So which means the only thing that you would be using to update your parameters is going to be the gradient out here. Does that make sense? There's another question. Yeah, Kunal? Thank you, right? So we'll get to that. So this is, this, is, this is history. I'm just giving you a quick peek into history. This is a so-called Elman network, OK? Uh, anyway, so story so far. In time series analysis, models must look at past inputs along with current input. And looking at a finite history of past inputs gives you the convolutional network, but ideally, if you want recursion going back into the infinite past. Now, Knox networks introduce this by recursing, or this recursion by feeding the output back into the input. And then you had simple, so-called simple recurrent networks. We are calling these simple recurrent networks because there's no true recurrence. And to understand what I mean by true recurrence, you have to consider the situation where you have an error happening only at some distant time and all the other inputs, outputs are accurate. If that is the case, then the only place where any gradient is passed to update the network is locally at this time. This doesn't consider the fact that the error over here is an accumulation of everything that happened in the past. 
So these are simple recurrent networks. Did that, this, did that uh, explanation make sense to all of you guys? Can you raise your hands? The lady at the back with the laptop open, can you shut that? Can you shut your laptop? Thank you, right? So uh, the uh, recurrence during learning is blocked at the memory units for the Jordan networks, and it's blocked at the cloned context units for the Elman networks, right? There's a poll. You may use your laptops for the polls, but then you shut it. Five seconds, guys. Okay. So, memory neuron models do not have true recurrence. They do dedicate neurons specifically to store past history, right? Regardless of whether it's the Jordan network or the Elman network. But then, going back to the question that was it Kunal who asked? What is the point of slicing these things? Obviously, it doesn't make slice it makes sense to clone the hidden state and slice it. Why don't we just merge it, right? So instead of taking this guy, cloning it, and then having that pass inputs, let me get rid of this hidden copy and just have the connection going straight through. And now, if I have a network of that kind, an error that happens at this time is actually going to be passing gradients all the way back there, and you're going to be accounting for the fact that this is cumulative error over time. And that gives us our state space model. So the state space model, so it's a simple step up, historically speaking. And the state space model has this structure. You have the hidden state at any time is a function of the input at that time and the hidden state at the immediately past time, past instant. And the output at any time is a function of just the hidden state at that time. So HT is the state of the network. And now, this is the hidden state in the network. There is the variable inside the network itself that is now storing information about what happened in the past. And the output is a function of this hidden state. So once again, you'd have to define the initial hidden state, H of minus one, for this whole thing to work but this is what is called a fully recurrent network because firstly you have the recurrence, you have information being stored inside the network about history, and an error at any time is going to influence the updates you make at all time. All right? So here's how the model looks. This is what it would be. At any given time, the hidden state HT is a function of the hidden state at t minus 1 and the current input. And the output depends on ht. So if I were to show you the complete sequence of computations that happens when you, when you analyze an input, it's going to look like this. You have, to in, you have to define your h of minus 1. How you do it, you, know, you can just set it to 0. This could be a learned parameter. And then at each time, the network gets the immediate input and the past hidden state as outputs. So this is actually the complete sequence of computations. Every column is identical to every other column, right? And once again, now if you just follow the arrows, you can see that if all I had was an input at time zero, and if I had no further inputs, then an input at time zero influences the outputs all the way to the end of time. Now, that hidden state doesn't just I just sort of hid a lot of information when I call this HT. With the hidden state itself can be arbitrarily complex. So the hidden state, for example, could have many different layers over here, right? And uh, when you're passing information from one time instant to the other, you're going to be passing information about all of these layers. So here is an example with where the hidden state is just 
got one layer, so it's one hidden layer. Here's what the network would look like. At each time, you have a single layer here getting its input from the previous time and the current input. Once again, an input at any time is going to influence the output for all time. And every column is identical to every other column. Here's a slightly more complex network. Now the hidden state has two layers. And you'd have to start, you'd have to obtain the initial value for this, for the hidden state for both layers in order to make your predictions. But the rest of the statements still hold. Every column is identical to every other column. And an input at any time is going to influence the output for all time. I can make things even more complex. I can have skip connections of this kind, but this still is a fully recurrent network. Or I can make things have uh, uh, connections going from an upper layer in the previous, at the previous time to a lower layer in the current time, and so on. So the point is for you to think of this entire block as a hidden state, which is, re which is receiving as its input this entire block from the previous time. And this is an output which is getting its input from the entire block over here. That is the basic idea. I can just hide it all, and this still goes back to this simple model that we had. Everybody clear about this? Yeah. Pardon me, I couldn't hear you. Could you speak? Uh, what's the purpose of defining a hidden state? So what is the purpose of defining a hidden state? Yes, I, I, we can simply use the output of this power here. So the output is, is a very simplified version of the hidden state. Now if you look at a hidden state over here, you can see the complexity of the information that's being held over here is much greater than the amount of information you have in the output itself. So there's just a lot more detail. Not only that, you can actually now have higher order recursions. You can have the taps going back multiple times, time instance. We don't normally do this, but as I explained over here, the longer the history you look into, the, the more complex the patterns that you can actually capture. And once again over here, every column here is going to be identical to every other column, but then if I had things going looking back two time steps into history, then the initial values would also have to be correspondingly defined. For the layer which is looking back two time steps into history, the initial value has got to be defined for two time steps. Devraj? Do you need the same number of layers at every step, or do you have any flexibility? So every column is identical to every other column. It's just a recurrent network. Okay. Generally, when we work with these models, we like to work with very simple models of this kind because they do the job. You don't need to get into more complex things of this nature, although there might be some modeling and computational benefits. One can imagine that there might be some benefits to this. It turns out that in practice, this is just fine. In terms of representation, we like to draw simplified diagrams. Now, these diagrams cause a lot of confusion. Now, if you look at this figure, this figure looks like the hidden state at any time is going to feed back to itself. There is no loop. These loops are really referring to passing the information to the next time. So also this one means that you have two layers in the hidden state, and they are both being passed to the next time. This one has two layers in the hidden state. Again, every loop is passing information to the next time. Yeah. The skip connection is just an architect architectural choice. We typically will use something of this kind. The memory is entirely from the loop. So let's take a look at the simplest version of these. This one, which has just one uh, hidden layer looping back. Now, this is what it would look like if I had two hidden layers looking, looping back. The more complex one is going to look like this. All of them make sense. And in terms of computation, let's consider the simplest model. The simplest model just has one recurrent hidden layer. So over here, there are two steps. First, remember how we did this. 
every layer is going to be first computing an affine value of all of its inputs and then applying an activation to it. So over here, the hidden layer is going to be computing, firstly, h of minus one we're going to assume is defined. Now the hidden layer at any time is first going to compute an affine function of two variables. So it's going to be comp computing an affine function of the current input and the hidden state at the previous time. So the affine function, remember, is a weighted sum of all of the inputs plus a bias. And the output is simply computing an affine function of the hidden state over here, and then it's applying an activation to it. Typically, for these hidden states, we will use tan, tan H activations. Outputs will be softmax. We'll see why, why this is the case in the next class. Now, there are two distinct sets of weights over here. The first one is the, you know, is the set of weights in the, at the same, same instant of time, the set of weights for this arrow going up. The second is the set of recurrent weights, which carry information across time. So we've uh, superscripted it differently over here. The one is referring to things going straight up. The one one refers to information coming across time. Same thing here. Here's the more complex model. Now over here, I have two hidden states. So what is the affine function, or what, is, what would we be computing the affine value for, for the first hidden state? That's going to be an affine function of the input and the first hidden state at the previous time. To that, you would apply an activation. The second hidden state now is going to compute an affine function of the output of the first hidden state and the second hidden state itself at the previous time, and then you compute an app, then, then you uh, apply an activation to it. The output is an affine function of just the second hidden state, and then you apply an app activation to it. So this is, looks very complex, but the idea is very simple. Now, how many distinct set of sets of weight matrix, weights would you have over here? Anyone want to tell me? Maybe some Rudhi in the middle can. Yeah. How many sets of weights would we have? Five, right? One, two, three, four, and five over here. Same thing for the more complex model. I won't go over it. Now, so you get the idea of recurrence. Yes. <laughs> we'll see that in the next class. We'll go over it in some detail, right? So now, there are many variants to the basic model. I, I picked these up from Andre Karpati's web page. This one is just a conventional MLP. It takes an input, it produces an output. Here's a recurrent model which takes a single input and produces a sequence of outputs. That too is feasible. So this might, for example, be a language generation problem. Or you give it an image and it produces an entire sequence of text describing the image. This is one where it takes a sequence of inputs and produces a single output like in the case of uh, sentiment classification for text or speech recognition. Or something like this, which takes a sequence of inputs and then produces a sequence of outputs when the, once the entire sequence of inputs is in. So this would be an example for, can, can anyone give me an example where this might be required? Conversation. Translation, conversation, right? English goes in, French comes out. Somebody gives me a question, the machine replies. And this, it turns out, represents all of these variants. So this is the most generic model, where at each time you have an input, and at each time you have an output. Everything else can be thought of as a special case. Here, you can say there are no outputs here and no inputs here, right? Here you can say you're ignoring these outputs. You could say here that, you're, that these inputs are zero. So uh, the uh, many to many, is what we will focus on because it sort of subsumes everything else. We will get to this model in the last lecture in this series. So the story so far, time series analysis must consider past inputs along with the current input. Knox networks achieve this by feeding back the output of the network. Simple recurrent networks maintain separate memory or context units, but there's no true recurrence. And uh, state space models, the one that we just saw last, 
retain information about the past through recurrent hidden states. These are fully recurrent networks. And the, but for these to work, you have to provide the initial value of all of these hidden states, because otherwise you cannot compute the output at time zero. And state space models, of course, enable current error to update parameters all the way to the past. Yeah. So right now, in the typical uh, recurrent neural network, your hidden layer, the, the, output, the output of the previous hidden layer is passed on to the next hidden layer. Yeah. You could if you wanted to. So this is, uh, you're assuming that the, all of the relevant information is being stored over here. So uh, in that sense, H has already captured information about X if you've learned it properly. But you're right. If you want to, you can always also have extra connections to the Xs. You're, comp you're making the model a little more, comple a little more complex. So it's not very clear how much you'd gain from it. You should try it out in your homework. <laughs> Never ask me. That's my answer. So now, how do we train this network? We're going to use something called back propagation through time. So now, before I continue, I want a bunch of you to raise your hands. Somebody. OK, Maxwell, of course. That's Preksha. Anybody else? Five more people. Chang Sheng. Your name? Rohan. Pardon me? Rohan. You're Rohan. OK. I keep, I, you should have your tag. I know you put it on your screen, right? So, so you guys, and one more person, someone at the back. Yep, Samrudhi. OK. You're going to help me train this network. Now, here's what you're going to be given. You're going to be given a collection of training inputs and outputs. But then this is a time series model, right? So Rohan, maybe you can answer this. What do you expect the input to be and, and the corresponding sequence of outputs to be? Cor corresponding output to be for one training instance. So it's going to be this. This is going to be the sequence of x's and the sequence of desired outputs, d's, correct? And the network is going to have a sequence of outputs. You want to train the network that the sequence of outputs is the same as the sequence of the desired outputs. So here's the unrolled computation. This is now this unrolled computation is just a giant shared parameter network, correct? Every column is identical to every other column, but this whole set, just drawing in drawing it in this manner might fool you. So let me draw this differently. I can draw it like so. I can say x0. This goes into H0, right? This goes into Y. This goes into H1. And this is X1, Y, H2, X2, Y. When I draw it in this manner, this just looks like one giant deep network, does it not? Going from the beginning to the end. So if you lay down on the side, you would see the network in the pro proper manner. This is just one giant network with shared parameters because every one of these guys is exactly the same. This is what we are going to use when we train our models. We can, we can train the network parameters via gradient descent. For gradient computation, of course, first we need to perform a forward pass, and then we'll do a backdrop and appropriate pooling of gradients. I'm assuming that the forward pass is done. So you just pass the entire data sequence through the network and generate outputs. I have pseudocode for it. I'm going to skip the pseudocode. We don't have time. Then we're going to compute gradients going backwards through time. Yeah. So the training like its parameters in the like in the former layer will get updated more than like the parameters in the later All net all all columns are identical, correct? Right, so they're all so it's just one set of parameters. Okay, so I'm just going to redraw it in this manner, just so that you can see what are the inputs and what are the outputs, just to be clear. And here is what we are going to compute the divergence for of. You're going to be computing the divergence between 
the sequence of outputs that the network produced and the sequence of desired outputs. It's not like just the sum of the divergences at individual times. It's really a divergence between two sequences. It is not the sum of divergences at individual times, just to emphasize this. It's the uh, sum of the, di it is the divergence between two sequences. So this is just some notation that I'm introducing. If I have, I'm going to be calling the output at each time y, uh, y i of t, it's a vector. I'm going to be calling the affine input at each time z subscript 2 at t because it's a second layer. The output of the hidden layer is h of t. The affine input at the hidden layer for the first hidden layer is z subscript superscript 1 is 1 of t. And then I have the input itself. Now the first thing I'm going to assume, uh, that then I have the weights. The weights matrix for each layer is shown by the superscript. So w superscript 1 is, I have, no, this should be two. W superscript two is the set of weights connected with this layer. W superscript one is the set of weights here. W11 is the set of weights over this looping connection. I have some error here, okay? So now the first step of Bragg propagation, we need to be able to compute the derivative of this divergence with respect to every one of these inputs. Again, remember that divergence is the divergence between a sequence of outputs and a sequence of desired outputs. So computing this the, the derivative of this divergence with respect to any one of these outputs can actually be challenging depending on how you define your divergence. This is something that we're going to encounter in a couple of lectures from now. Regardless, I need to be able to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each one of these outputs. For now, we're going to assume that this is feasible and that we have the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of yt, yt minus one, yt minus two, and so on, correct? So in a special case, there are some special cases where this divergence can simply be thought of as the sum of the divergences at individual times. In that case, it's very trivial to compute the derivative of the divergence for each time. It's simply going to be the derivative of the local divergence with respect to the corresponding y value. But in the generic setting, that's not going to be feasible. You should not imagine that this is the, the, that this is the generic case, OK? So let's start off. Who was my first victim? Samruddhi at the back, right? Assume that I have the derivative of the divergence with respect to yt. What is the first step in back propagation that I would perform? Now here's the clue. I'm going to start off at the rightmost end, right? Remember, when I would think of the network in this manner, where do I start? At the top. The final one is going to be, let's say, the final yt. And then I'm going to be working my way backwards, correct? So Samradhi, what is the first derivative I will compute? So what is that going to be? No, is it going to be the derivative of yt or? The divergence. The divergence, correct? So, so what would this be? Just tell me what the formula is going to be. This is the derivative of the divergence with respect to yt. So it will be uh, derivative of divergence with respect to yt and z, or yt with respect to z. That is going to be the Jacobian of. Uh, that's. This is easy. We are done, right? At, at, at time, this is z1 superscript. So that we can do. Or z2, we call it z2. You shouldn't look at the slides, by the way. You should answer me first. Okay. Now, from there, who was the next person who wanted to answer? Rohan, right? Was it you? Okay. What would the next step be? What would the next derivative be? Okay, so what is that? So this is going to be the derivative of divergence with respect to z2 of t, correct? So what was the next step, next thing you would compute? The derivative of that with respect to z1. Uh, z1 or 
So here are two variables, right? There's a variable out here, there are weights here, and there's the z. So when you're going backwards, which derivative, what would it be? So if I were to compute the derivative with respect to the output of this green box, what would that be? So I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to h of t, right? So what will that be here? So anybody else? So somebody else have raised their hand. Yes, Maxwell. This is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to zt times the weights matrix, correct? That's going to be w2. So because you're taking, this is just a standard back propagation, is it not? So that's easy. Now, I want to compute, as a next step, I want to compute the, okay, maybe someone else, who else raised their hand? All right, and next I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to what variable? Okay, what would that be? The derivative of the divergence with respect to W2, that's going to be? So remember how we did this for weights in the past, right? I always said that if I had some variable a, x and I had some, and this is the weight and some variable y, which gave you the divergence, then the derivative of the divergence with respect to w was, what was this? If x and y were vectors, what was that? We said we did this in the, this was going to be x times the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, right? That was the weight. You remember this formula? Raise your hands if you do, right? That was, so now help me with that. If I use that formula, what is the derivative with respect to W2? H times the of H T times the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z2 of T. So this is clear to everybody, right? I'm just sort of basically performing the computation. So that's what we have. And then what else, what would the next step be? Someone else want to answer me? Maybe I can select Sanjana, what would the next one be? What would the next step be, going back? That's the derivative of the divergence with respect to the affine value at the, at that layer, right? At the hidden layer. So what is that value going to be? Can you tell me? Someone else? Guys, we've been through this so much that it should be, you should be able to do it blind. Ameya, can you tell me? Everybody's asleep, right? <laughs> okay. So this is the derivative. That's all we had to do. It's not so complex. Okay, we got through the easy bit. Now, what else can I, can I compute? What would be the next derivative you, you compute? With respect to, why do you want to compute the derivative with respect to inputs? The weights, right? So the next one is going to be with respect to these weights, and that's simply going to be, again, so we just did this, it's just going to be xt times the derivative with respect to z. Correct? There's one more derivative missing over here. What is that? The derivative going backwards, and that is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to this weight, which is going to be h of t minus 1 times the derivative with respect to the z. Everyone clear so far? Right. Then it gets interesting. I can come back here, I can, and now I have a, this, this is the second line, right? 
I locally come down and I can compute the derivative with respect to the z over here, which is simply the derivative with z of the divergence with respect to y t minus 1 times the Jacobian of this box. Okay? And now I can compute the derivative with respect to this h, but then here's where it gets interesting. This h, I would have asked you to help me, but I think I'm not going to get help from you guys. You're all asleep. So I will answer myself, OK? Uh, this h actually goes out two ways, correct? So there's going to be two derivatives flowing back in. So this derivative here is going to be the derivative of z2, the derivative at z2 times w2, plus the derivative at z1 times the recurrent weight. You see what happened here? Right? So this was easy, kind of. But then there's something else. Now I also have the derivative with respect to this weight here. And the derivative with that respect to that weight is simply going to be ht minus 1 times the derivative at z2. But then this weight is the same as the weight over here. These are shared parameters. So what would happen to the derivative? You actually increment it. You add it. Right? And so then once you do that, I can go back here. This is simple. I can just compute the, I can compute the derivative with respect to z1 by multiplying the derivative here with the Jacobian of the activation. Now, once again, when I compute the derivative for this weight, it's going to be xt minus 1 times the derivative at z1. But then that's going to add to the derivative I got at the next time, because these are shared parameters. It's the same weight. So the weight here is the same as the weight over here. Right? So they get added. And then, of course, I can compute the derivative with respect to this weight. But once again, this weight is the same as this guy here. So you're going to get an additive term. So the derivative with respect to this recurrent weight is going to get incremented by ht minus 2 times the derivative over here, z1. So you saw the little sequence of op or computations going back, right? And I can take this, perform this all going all the way back. And now here is the interesting thing. Finally, there's one variable over here which we never defined. That is h of minus 1. What is h of minus 1? You can learn it, like everything else, right? You can just set it to 1, or you can learn it, give it, give it, give it some variable, or set it to 0. It, but it's, it can be viewed as a learnable parameter. So the entire sequence of operations, I have this over here. At each, you're going to be going backwards through time, which is why it is back propagation through time. At each time, first you compute the derivative with respect to the affine value here. Then you're going to compute the derivative with respect to the output here, which is actually the sum of two, two components, one going up, one from the side. And then you can go down and compute the derivative with respect to the affine value here. Then you have three sets of weights. Actually, three, there should be one, two, three in this example, right? So I would be getting the derivatives for each of those three sets of weights, but they get incremented at each time because it's one giant shared parameter network. I have pseudocode. Take a look at it, right? So uh, that's the basic idea of training the network, back propagation through time. And we saw, of course, that this can be generalized to any architecture. I have a poll, but I'm not going to, I don't have time, so pause here. We're going to go back, go, go ahead. I, but, after the class, please do go and answer those polls. 1006, 1007, and 1008, and we will take count, right? Just to be sure. Just release all of the polls, and, and don't look at the answers, OK. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the final bit. We said we can do things in different ways, we were always looking at analysis going left to right. We said we are performing series analysis. I want to look at the past stock values to predict the stock values tomorrow. But there are other situations where you will have reference to the future. 
So for example, if I'm analyzing a sequence text, I have a sequence of words, and I want to tell you for each word which part of speech it is. To predict the part of speech of a word, you cannot just look at the word in isolation, right? The word could be a verb, it could be a noun, it could be an adjective. To figure out what it is, you have to look at the context that the word occurs in. And the context is present, represented not only in the previous words in the sentence, it's also indicated by the future words. If it's an adjective, clearly you have to look at the future. If it's a verb, the past is going to tell you. The thing is, in order to make a prediction at any time, you can look at the entire sentence, but now the entire sentence is available for you to make a prediction for every single word. In this case, you can use what is called a bidirectional network. This is still a time series model, but now it's bidirectional. So this is a recurrent network with both forward and backward recursion. How does this work? Within any layer, now I'm going to be looking at just one layer. You're going to have some inputs coming in. You have some inputs coming going, outputs going out. But within the layer, there are two distinct recursions. There's one recursion which starts off from the input and goes from the input and goes all the way to the end. So that is actually going to require the hidden state defined at h minus 1. The other one, oh, so I forgot, OK. I need something longer. This can't distinguish between the two rows, OK. But anyway, so you, the pink one here is, is considering the inputs going from left to right. And the blue one, the blue row, starts off at the end and works its way backwards. Now for the blue row, you're going to have to define the initial value out here at the end. And then once both of these computations are done, the output is going to be a function of the, at any time, is going to be a function of the outputs of both the forward and the backward recursion at that time. You could do this by maybe adding the two or simply concatenating the two side by side to give you, to explicitly retain both bits of information. So the overall network, overall computation is going to be like this. The input goes in for any layer. The forward net processes the data going from 0 to t. And you're only, this is only computing the hidden state values. The backward net processes the data, input data in reverse time, going from the beginning to the start. And then finally, the actual output of the layer or the block combines the computations of both outputs, of, of both forward and backward net, either by addition or by concatenation. And the entire network itself is just can be, you can, you can do it in different ways. You can have several of these blocks chained together one on top of the other. Or within each block, the forward and backward recursion itself could be a pretty complex network. Is all of this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands if it is, right? OK. So this obviously is a very nice extension to the basic recurrent model. It only applies when you have access to future data in making, the present, making predictions about the current time. And uh, one of the, you know, where the problems where this applies are uh, things like uh, part of speech tagging for text or speech recognition and so on. There's a fourth poll. You're not doing any of it, okay? After the class, don't forget, we will tag you. We, we, we will take count. So the nice thing over here is that as far as code is concerned, you don't need separate to write two separate modules of code. The backward computation, for instance, could be done by the same piece of code that does forward computation. You just flip the input and pass it in, then flip the output, and you get it right back. So it's kind of very convenient. And it's a trick that we will use all the time. Now, how would backpropagation through time work? How do you train these models? To train these models, again, it's very easy. You're going to assume that you have derivatives coming in with respect to the outputs of the block. And then if the derivatives are coming in with respect to the outputs of the block, let's assume that you have concatenated the, the forward and backward computations. 
So the output of the block HH was the concatenation of HF, and, and I'll call this the vertical concatenation of HF and HB. Correct? So when you get the derivatives backwards, you're going to get the derivatives for HF and the derivative for HB concatenated because that's what you're getting the derivatives for. From this, I can, you can slice out the forward portion and the backward portion because you know which is which. And now you can have, so you're gonna get the uh, separate derivatives for both the forward and the backward. You could separate the two out. And now for the forward portion, you can get the, you can just extract the derivative, forward derivatives at each time and then perform back propagation through time using just these forward derivatives to compute derivatives going backwards. For the, now here observe that in the process you're going to get derivatives for all of these parameters and these intermediate variables, but you're also going to get the derivatives with respect to the input to the block. And the input to the block is going to be complete, the entire width, right? Similarly, now we can take the backward derivative portion over here, and now BPTT is not actually going back through time, it's going forward through time. And so for the backward block, you would start computing the derivatives out here and work your way in this direction from the end to the beginning, from the beginning to the end. And that's going to give you the derivatives for all the parameters here. It's also going to give you the derivative with respect to the input to the block. So at the input to the block, you got derivatives coming in from here as well as the derivatives from here. You're going to add the two up because clearly the input fed both layers. So if you follow the standard rules of uh, influence, the derivatives would add up when you got out here. And now those derivatives can be passed on backwards, right? So again, I have pseudocode for it. I'll stop here. I just wanted to make sure I ended on time. So here is the story so far. Time series analysis must consider past inputs along with current input. Recurrent networks look into the infinite past through a state space framework where hidden states, you have hidden states that recurs on themselves. Training recurrent networks requires defining a divergence between the actual and desired output sequences, not just the individual outputs. And Back, we, we need to back propagate gradients over the entire chain of recursion. So this is back propagation through time. And you want to pool the gradients with respect to individual parameters over time. Bidirectional networks analyze data both ways, from beginning to end and back end to the beginning. And in these networks, back propagation rules must follow the chain of recursion separately through the forward nets and the backward net. So in the forward net, you're going to be propagating gradients from the end to the beginning. In the backward net, you're going to be propagating them from the beginning to the end. So we'll stop here. So recurrent models are excellent models for series data, for time series prediction, classification, sequence generation, and so on. But then you have all of these questions, other questions. How well do they work? What are the limitations, and how can we get past those limitations? So we'll deal with these in the next class. Thank you.